In 2020, doctors treated a man for a lesion on his tongue. It had been bleeding for weeks. It was either cancer, a benign tumor, or a self-inflicted injury. Based on the patient's history, they had a sneaking suspicion it was the latter, that he had done this to himself in some way. So they asked him questions, evaluated his mouth, set to solving the problem. It did need solving. In the end, it was what they call a pyogenic granuloma. Didn't you want to know that? I could have put the picture up for you, but I decided not to. They have a picture of it. So what that is, is a small area of inflammation brought on by a cellular overreaction to trauma in the mouth. The man was relieved to find that his condition wasn't fatal, though the lesion needed to be cut out, of course. The doctors in their report wrote, although we wouldn't state that we gave the patient a tongue lashing, we strongly advised him that he return to his dentist and abstain from tobacco, alcohol, illicit drugs, and taste-testing scalding food directly from the pot, all things the patient had a history of indulging in, which contributed to his affliction. Now, in Genesis 20, Abraham's mouth leads to some serious health trouble for a bunch of people, trouble that caused real danger to his family, and it was, in fact, potentially fatal to an entire nation. In the end, He's going to be on the mend thanks to the intervention of the great physician. But before the story is over, Abraham is going to receive a very thorough and embarrassing tongue lashing from a pagan king. Of course, we know that Abraham has made this mistake before. We expect him as as students of the Bible, as lovers of of these heroes of the faith, we, we sort of expect him to have learned his lesson before and grown enough to not slip up in this way again. But here he is relapsing into an old lie, an old mistake that he has made before. Though we are new creations in Christ, we, of course, still fall short of Christ, our example, and our potential that the Lord says we are capable of, right? So the Lord comes and says, okay, if you are born again, you are a new creation. The mind of Christ is in you. The heart of Christ is in you. The Holy Spirit indwells you. There is no temptation that is too great for you to find a way of escape because that is what the Lord has done for you. He gives you this new mindset. He gives you spiritual gifts. He gives you all of these things. And yet none of us live up to that potential. We do struggle and we do uh, fall short. We fail in ways small and sometimes large. And so on the one hand, when we read a passage like this, it is a comfort to see that like us, the heroes of the faith were not perfect. And they weren't. And the Bible goes out of its way to say that they were people like us so that we can identify with them and so that we can learn from their example and hopefully avoid some of the mistakes they made. But human weakness, human imperfection, even when we're in Christ, that is not an excuse for sin, not ever. So sin is a reality in our lives because we're imperfect and we're not glorified yet, and yet it is not an excuse. There's grace, but of course, should we sin, that grace would abound God forbid we settle for that sort of mentality and that sort of Christianity. Episodes like the one we're about to read reveal how disappointing, how distasteful, how detrimental it is when God's people scheme and sin rather than surrender in trust to the Lord. And on top of that, we see that when God's people do that, it doesn't work anyway, and they don't get what they were hoping to get anyway. So let's take a look at this starting in verse 1. From there, Abraham traveled to the region of the Negev and settled between Kadesh and Shur. Why did Abraham move? At Hebron, which is where he had been living maybe for about 20 years, they think, at Hebron, Abraham had known intimate fellowship with God. He had had interacted with God face-to-face multiple times. Now he's back in the southern part of the land in what they call the Negev, Some say that he never should have left and that that was the original problem. He left the Oaks of Mamre and he's down down here in the south and that was the problem. On the other hand, consider what has happened in the passage before. If you weren't here last time, you can just kind of look at chapter 19 and take a look. The entire valley, 
All of the cities of the whole region, except for one little town, had been completely obliterated in fire and brimstone. It was a complete disaster area like Chernobyl. You don't hang around Chernobyl anymore. It's a bad place to be. You know, when Mount St. Helens blew in 1980, it took 230 square miles of forest with it in an instant. Uh, many roads and highways were closed for weeks. And that's in a modern society where we have lots of heavy machinery that can deal with these sorts of things. Crops were destroyed in the area. Thousands upon thousands of animals were wiped out. The region was laid waste. And now imagine, you know, a big area of our valley being destroyed by heavenly fire and brimstone. Abraham's herds needed food. They needed food like today. And there wasn't any food anymore. Everything around him was ash and salt. And we see that at the end of our text, he's going to stay in the Negev, and there's no mandate from God to return. There's no repentance of Abraham to say, I shouldn't have come here. Let's go back where we were. So we really can't say that it was wrong for Abraham to sojourn down here to this region. In fact, we can even see some spiritual maturity in his choice on one level. One pastor points out that at least this time around when he was leaving because he needed a place to feed his herds, at least this time around, Abraham didn't go to Egypt. The last time he was in a tight spot, he said, well, we better go to Egypt. That was well outside where the Lord had given him boundaries, right? The Lord had said originally to Abraham, go to a land I'm going to show you. You're going to be a pilgrim and sojourn through that land. And then when, when things got tough, he jumped out of that land and went to Egypt, and it was a big disaster. This time around, he still needs to figure out where he's going to go, where he's going to feed his herds. His herds are going to die otherwise. But he doesn't go to Egypt. He stays within the boundaries God had previously given him. So it's not the going that was the problem. This was the problem. The end of verse 1 says, While he was staying in Gerar, Abraham said about his wife Sarah, She is my sister. So King Abimelech of Gerar had Sarah brought to him. Gerar is the royal city of the Philistine king. Uh, his, he's called Abimelech, probably a title rather than a name. This was a good spot for grazing herds. It was near the coast. Hey, who doesn't want to live in a place like San Diego, right? If somebody said, you can live for free in San Diego, you probably think, yeah, maybe I want to do that. As Christians, we know because the Bible tells us that God has specific, particular intentions for our lives. Of course, he has intentions for the church in general, but he has specific intentions for your life and the life of your family. He has good works planned beforehand that he wants you to walk in and discover. He has not just a sort of generalized one-size-fits-all will for every Christian. He has a, a particular life that he wants to lead you into, right? That's what the Bible says. But God does not always give us an explicit diagram every single morning. You don't wake up every morning to an email that says, here are the decisions that you need to make, and here's the flow chart of how you should make them, right? Now, in the wilderness, we think of the children of Israel. They did have something like that. In the, in the wilderness, in the book of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, Israel followed a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire wherever it went. It would lift up, and they'd say, okay, it's time to pack up and go, and then they would follow it, and it would pick a place and stop, and then they would camp there, and that's what they did for 40 years. We do not have that kind of visible manifestation, a visible beacon like that. Rather, we're invited to walk by faith as we apply the Word of God that has been revealed to us and apply that Word to our choices. We're invited to seek the Lord, to seek the kingdom of God, to inquire of God and the Holy Spirit and say, we want to be led, would you please lead us? And he wants to lead us. And so we apply his word, which he has revealed to us, to our choices. But sometimes you are going to have to make life decisions without a conspicuous directive telling you what to do. The good news is that when a person is walking with God, anywhere they go, they can be a blessing. That was kind of the overarching idea for Abraham's life. God had told him, hey, you're going to go to a land I'm going to show you. I have very particular things I'm going to do through you. You're going to have a lot of really cool opportunities. You're going to have this son of promise, all of these different things. But as you're pilgriming, he says, you're going to just be a blessing to all the nations of the world. 
Of course, we know that that was ultimately fulfilled through Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, through those generations. But Abraham also was meant to be a blessing to the people around him as he went through this land. The problem is Abraham was dropping the ball on that aspect of his spiritual life. And so we can walk with God, and anywhere we go, we can be a spiritual blessing and a a positive influence and presence wherever we find ourselves, whether that's San Diego or Hanford or wherever you find yourself. Uh, On on Wednesday mornings, Pastor Jake has been taking the men through the book of Romans, and today we were in Romans 14, and there we see that a Christian can promote peace and joy and righteousness no matter where they are, as long as they are walking in the Spirit and trusting the Lord. So Abraham could honor God in Hebron or in the Negev, and in this case, there wasn't a very specific, hey, stay here, or hey, don't go there, at least as far as the text is concerned. The problem is Abraham is not in a mindset of trust. He's not resting in the Lord. He's not really following a directive of the Lord rather than making decisions based on fear. As we see his part in this story, he is making decisions based on fear. He's not thinking about how he can bless people around him. He is thinking about how he can protect himself. So rather than being a source of blessing to these new people, these new neighbors that he's connecting with, Abraham chooses to lie and thereby becomes a detriment to the community around him. Read verse 3. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, you are about to die because of the woman you have taken, for she is a married woman. Many other translations, maybe yours, renders God's message this way, you are a dead man. He gets right to the point. Now, this interaction between God and this Philistine king raises some big questions. Why did God appear to Abimelech, but it seems like he didn't appear to Pharaoh chapters ago when this same situation was playing out? More importantly, why doesn't God do this now? Aren't there lots of Abimelechs? all around us in all the halls of government and, you know, whether it's local, state, national, international. Uh, Wouldn't it be great if God just rattled every unbeliever's cage like this at night and appeared to them and said, I'm going to judge you and you're going to die unless you get right with me? On one level, we think that would be a great idea. Now, in reality, every person is Abimelech as far as the Lord is looking at him here. God doesn't care that this guy has called himself a king and sits on a little throne, and none of that matters. God looks at him and he says, you're a dead man. And that's the reality of every single human being on planet earth before a holy God. He looks down on us and and he, he has to explain to us that we are guilty before him, guilty of sin, guilty of transgression, guilty of imperfection, and therefore we are condemned to death, not just physical death, eternal death. God has revealed this, but he also has revealed that he has a great desire to save sinners, to save the condemned. He says there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus, and it's, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance so that they can be saved out of condemnation and transformed into be new creations and have life everlasting. And so why doesn't he just give everyone a dream visit like this, especially when we see how effective it was in this situation? That seems like a great mission, a great plan, if you ask me. But the truth is this, God has revealed himself to the people of earth, not in a dream, but in other better ways. In Abraham's time, there was no Bible. There was no testimony of the incarnate God-man. Christ had not become incarnate. There were only a few oral traditions passed down through a very minute number of people who knew a few things about the one true God. In all the land of Canaan, effectively, there's Abraham and people he has taught, and this mysterious guy, Melchizedek, we don't know what he's doing. And otherwise, there there isn't. There's no radio. There's no internet. There's no television. There are no books. There is no Bible. There's no, no testimony other than these limited things that have been handed down through Adam. And even Adam had very little information when it came to theology and the unfolding work of of redemption and the, the work of God. And so we're told in the book of Hebrews that in 
previous times, God spoke in various ways to reveal himself, but now we are at a point in human history where God has spoken to us by his son. He has revealed what needs to be revealed through his son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. You have had a a visitation, as it were, from God himself. And we are told, okay, well, I don't get to see Jesus, right? Jesus walked around, uh, you know, the region of Galilee 2,000 years ago. I don't get to see him. Okay, well, Jesus has that covered. He says, I have come in the volume of the book. This is why God has given us the scriptures, 66 books put together so that we can know everything we need to know for life and for godliness, so that we can know exactly who God is, exactly what his plan is, exactly what we're guilty of, and exactly how to be made right with him. He has come in the volume of the book. And now on top of that, he doesn't just uh, appear to one guy in a dream every now and then. He sends multiplied millions of his children, people like you and I, as ambassadors to go out and that we bring the message of who God is to the lost and dying in the world around us. That's the deal. He says, yeah, you're the one that brings the life and death message to the Abimelechs of the world. Why doesn't God just appear in a dream to everyone? Because it's your task to go and preach the gospel. It's my task to go and preach the gospel. Just as we recognize that it should have been Abraham who was proclaiming the testimony of the one true God to Abimelech. None of this would have been necessary if Abraham was doing his job and was living the life that he had been called to live and the life that he had agreed to live before the Lord. But he was AWOL at this time because he's all self-focused and freaked out and living by fear. And so he's not doing the job that God has given him to do. Now, on top of that, we know that a personal visit from Jesus would not convince everyone. You know how we know that? Because Jesus had a pretty convincing visit to this earth for 33 years. And what happened? The crowd shouted, crucify him. They shouted it over and over and over when there was no reason to do so. The one who raised the dead before their eyes, the one who gave sight to the blind before their eyes, the one who spoke as no one had ever spoken before, the one who could tell them the very thoughts that they were thinking in their hearts, him they refused and had tortured and killed. On top of that, if we want to talk about the effects of sin and just how, how great a pollutant it is. Think of the angels in heaven. The angels in heaven, they're before the throne of God, seeing God as he is. A third of them said, you know what? I think we're going to give the devil a chance. And so the idea that if God just showed himself to everyone, then everyone would believe that is not true. And the Bible even specifically references this in the story of the rich man and Lazarus. What does the rich man say? He says, hey, please go back and tell my relatives. And he says, listen, that's not going to do any good. If they're not going to believe the word of God, they won't believe a visible manifestation of God either. By the way, notice here how God highlights the significance and the sanctity of marriage. He doesn't come to Abimelech and say, listen, I need this woman for a providential project I'm working on, and I need you to not bother her. That's not what he says. He says, she is a married woman, so I'm going to put you in the ground. (laughs) That's what he says. God takes marriage very seriously. It is a set-apart relationship as far as God is concerned, unlike any other human relationship. It is unique in depth and benefit, and it is meant to be carefully guarded and lovingly developed Though God's people were treating it casually in this passage, the Lord absolutely was not, and so we should take that to heart. Verse 4 says, Now Abimelech had not approached her, so he said, Lord, would you destroy a nation even though it is innocent? Didn't he himself say to me, she is my sister? And she herself said, he's my brother. I did this with a clear conscience and clean hands. You know, for a Philistine, this guy's all right. Uh, (laughs) Philistines were not real quality people as far as the Bible is concerned, but, but this guy has a little bit of integrity. He's worried about innocence and he's worried about justice. He's worried about his people. At least he's worried about his definition of innocence and justice. He's genuinely surprised and scandalized by God's accusation here. It's news to him. He says, I have a clear conscience and clean hands. I find it interesting when God responds to him 
he, he says, yeah, I know you have a clear conscience, but he leaves out the part about clean hands. In this particular situation, Abimelech hadn't knowingly transgressed, and yet he was still guilty. He still had taken another man's wife into his harem. He didn't have clean hands, not when it came to this situation and certainly not when it came to who he worshiped and how he acted and all of these other things. So you have this guy there. He's thinking, well, I, I didn't really mean to do the wrong thing. I have a clear conscience and clean hands. And, and the Lord says, yeah, I know you, were, you kind of were given the bum's rush here, but man, you don't have clean hands. You know, if you're not a Christian here tonight, you can try to justify or rationalize the mistakes you've made, but you have offended the perfect and holy God. You have committed countless acts of treason against the king of the universe. You are not innocent. You are guilty. We all, like sheep, have gone, sheep have gone astray, and Meryl Streep, for that matter. <laughs> So we all, I'm not putting this on anybody in particular, we all like sheep have gone astray. There is none righteous, no, not one. If you're a Christian here tonight, it's because you have recognized, oh yeah, I'm guilty and I am in real trouble. And hey, there's a savior who says he will take my place and take my guilt upon himself and give me his righteousness. Yes, I want in for that. If you're not born again, you're in real trouble because you are still in the state of condemnation and of guilt and you are guilty. Luckily, God has a plan to save you from your guilt and therefore his wrath, his just wrath against sin. Verse six, God said to him in the dream, yes, I know that you did this with a clear conscience. I have also kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I have not let you touch her. Wait a minute. He kept Abimelech from sinning? Then why, oh, why doesn't God simply keep everyone from sinning all the time? This is an important question. If God can keep people from sinning, which he can, then why doesn't he do it all the time? God has given human beings what we call a freed will, a real freed will. Not this phony double speak where we say, well, you know, there are some traditions who say, yes, man has a free will to only do what God forces them to do. That's not a free will, and nobody, nobody would use language in such a way to say that that, that is free. The Bible presents God as being all-powerful, as being in charge, as accomplishing his will the way he wants it done. And it also reveals very clearly that he, in his all-power, has given human beings genuine freed will. Paul speaks to Philemon about, hey, your own free will. I want you to do something out of your own free will, he says. In Ezekiel chapter 18, it talks about the the lives that people can choose, either choosing a life that leads to death or choosing a life that leads to life in the end. And the choice is between whether you will obey God or not. That determines whether you go to life or whether you go to death in the end. The Lord, in his all-powerful sovereignty, has given human beings this freedom because he is a God of love. And he is looking for those who will love him in return, who will freely choose to reciprocate the love that, with which he loved us first. That's what he's doing. That's why he frees our will. In Hosea chapter 6, God says, I desire faithful love. Love requires a choice. Anyone in here who's ever been in a romantic relationship knows that you cannot force a person to love you. That's the opposite of love. If you threaten a person and say, if you don't love me, I'll burn you alive, they say, of course I love you. That person doesn't love you. That person needs to be saved from you because you're a maniac and a monster. (laughs) And so God is looking for faithful love. Now, he has done all that is necessary to save us. He does all the work. He is the one that has accomplished everything. We do not merit salvation, earn salvation, uh, 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 contribute to salvation at all. He has done it all. But he waits for those who respond to his call and who will invite him in. He gives us the choice to obey or disobey, just like he did in the first chapters of Genesis with Adam and Eve. He did not give that choice to the lions or the tigers or the bears. No, he gave it to Adam and Eve. He says, will you obey me? Because I want to have a a special relationship with you, human beings, because you are made in my image. You are my special, unique creation. Through you, we're going to do something very different and very special. 
So why did God then put his thumb on the scale and stop this particular sin? This is where God's will and providence come into play alongside the fact that he's given humans free will. You see, God has revealed a particular plan for how the Messiah would come through a certain couple. And he had told Abraham, Sarah is going to have a baby within one year. And then within that window of time where the son of promise would be conceived, what does Abraham do? He makes the horrifying decision to send Sarah into the harem of a pagan king. Talk about bad timing, man. Come on. Uh, this, is a, this is such a bad deal. This has dire historic implications. Uh, this is something that, that, that cannot be let go. While God allowed Abraham the freedom to make this bad decision, he would not allow Abraham's bad decision to derail heavenly work. Does that make sense? This has to get done in a certain way. The child of promise between Abraham and Sarah, not Sarah and some Philistine guy. Is it, hey, this is going to happen within a year, and it's going to be between Abraham and Sarah, and I'm bringing the Messiah so we can deal with life and death and sin and salvation once and for all. And so it was providentially essential that Abimelech not become intimate with Sarah, and so God stopped it from happening. And so again, we see in the book of Genesis ample evidence to dispense forever with the repulsive theory of what is called meticulous determinism, that God causes every single thing in human history to happen, including sin, including tragedy, and including the horrors of the world. There are Christian traditions that teach that there are no rogue molecules. Everything that happens are pieces that God moved on the board and forced to happen for his own glory. The Bible doesn't present anything close to that. In fact, we see the interplay of free will and providence in this very uh, passage. Verse 7 says, Now return the man's wife, for he's a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you will live. But if you do not return her, know that you will certainly die, you and all who are yours. Very clear choice. Very clear options. Genuine choice. Now, God gives mankind this same choice on the spiritual level, repent or die. Sometimes the Lord gives people decades to decide whether they will obey him or not. We think of the sin of the Canaanites. He comes and he says, hey, the, the sin of the Amorites and the Canaanites is not full. We're going to wait a really long time. Or we think of the generations leading up to the flood, over a hundred years that God was patient and waited, giving them opportunity to repent. Even the Jews during the split kingdom period, he sent prophet after prophet, decade after decade, giving them time to repent, asking them, asking them, asking them. Decades of patience and opportunity. Other times, God gives only days. Jonah showed up to Nineveh and he said, 40 days, you're done. And they had to make a quick decision. Or we think of Belshazzar's feast where he says, hey, like, you've been waiting measured like tonight right now. You, you, tonight is the night. And he died that night. We don't know whether we have days or decades left to walk with God. If you're not a believer, you don't know if you're going to make it home tonight. I hope you do, but you don't know if you're going to. And it is appointed unto man once to die, and then comes judgment. And so you might have days, you might have decades, you might have minutes before you stand before your Creator, and He's going to ask you, whether you uh, received salvation from Jesus Christ or whether you're going to bear the punish punishment for your sins. And there's no second chance after death. We wish there was, but there isn't. The Bible is very clear. Now, for us as born-again believers, we also don't know if we have days or decades left to walk with God, so we want to be about His business. Hebrews puts it this way, let's encourage each other daily while it's still called today so that none of us are hardened by sin's deception. So Abimelech had this choice, repent or die, go to the prophet and be healed. Here's the problem. Your prophet's a liar. Your prophet's a bum. That's what I would have thought if I was Abimelech. Think of what an obstacle this could have been for Abimelech and the people of Gerar. You know, the hypocrisy of Christians is a favorite complaint that unbelievers bring up. It's often just an excuse, just a straw man to derail a conversation. But the truth is it can be a real hindrance when God's people who say, yeah, I'm a Christian, but then they play the hypocrite the way that Abraham is here. Why should a non-believer believe if instead of bringing joy and peace and righteousness with us, we bring strife and cheating and anger and resentment and just a bad taste? 
Not a bad taste because we're preaching the gospel and it is the savor of death to some, but just a bad taste because we're being jerks or because we're not actually living out the Christian life the way we're telling those people they need to live out the Christian life. And so hypocrisy can be a real, true stumbling block and hindrance. Verse 8, early in the morning, Abimelech got up and called all his servants together and personally told them all these things. Then the men were terrified. The women of Gerar, perhaps the men too, had been afflicted by a plague. They didn't know much about God, but they could tell he was serious, and we see that they feared him. And guess what? That was the beginning of wisdom for them. That was the beginning of them getting out of this problem and into a better situation. Sometimes we tend to water down the idea of fearing God and say it's just about respecting Him or reverencing Him. And sure, as children of God, as believers, we do not need to fear that God will hurt us or harm us or mistreat us in any way. He won't. That's obvious. But God is absolutely serious about discipline and judgment and wrath. As Christians who are sent out to give the message of the gospel, we should be careful not to ignore or, or skip over the reality of God's wrath when we're preaching to people. God is going to crush those who are not saved, and they should fear Him. That is, that is just the truth. The Bible puts it this way, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And so we need to bring a message of hope, but hope from what? It's not just hope that, oh, your life will be a little bit better. You'll feel good inside your best life now. <laughs> it's that you won't have your worst life later. <laughs> you, want, you, you want to explain to people the reality of who God really is because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. People need to understand. Verse 9, Abimelech called Abraham in and said to him, what have you done to us? How did I sin against you that you have brought such enormous guilt on me and on my kingdom? You, what, uh, you have done things to me that should never be done. Abimelech also asked Abraham, what made you do this? Abimelech was a pagan, but he had some basic sense of right and wrong, right? They were into all kinds of weird stuff in Canaan back then. But he understood that there was right and wrong. The book of Romans speaks of morality being written on human hearts. We're made in God's image, and God is a moral God. It's why Cain murdered Abel in secret, and when he was found out, he was really worried that, that other people were going to execute him because he knew what he had done was wrong. All cultures and societies recognize that there are rights and wrongs. They don't always agree on what they are, of course, because man is in rebellion <clears throat> and loves his sin. But even the most savage societies have a sense of the existence of right doing and wrong doing, the Spartans, some of these other cultures. Uh, consider the Waurani people of Ecuador. They are one of the most extreme examples of what human society is willing to permit when it comes to behavior and treating one another in a way that we do not want to be treated, often choosing raid rather than trade. They have, and this is a quote, the highest rate of homicide of any society known to anthropology. Killing is a regular part of their culture. And yet, when one of their tribe is killed, they recognize that this demands retribution. It demands revenge. Though bloodshed is commonplace, researchers found that many Waurani dream of escaping the cycle of death their culture is trapped in. A sense of right and wrong is engraved on their hearts. They're addicted to murder, and yet they wish to be free of it. That's because we are created in the image of God. You know who's not worried about murder? Tigers and lions. They don't feel bad about it. And this is one of the big problems of evolution. Why do we feel bad when we harm others? It's because there's a moral law written on our hearts. Now, Abimelech had been wronged, and he's very direct. And he's saying, what made you do this? Why did you do this? What's motivating our decisions? You and I are making decisions every day, mostly small decisions, what shirt to wear, what socks to wear, which route to take to work, but sometimes big decisions. And we're making a lot of decisions about how we relate to the world around us, how we talk to that supervisor, how we interact with that individual. What is motivating those decisions? Why are you doing the things that you're doing in your life? Listen, Christianity is not simply a list of things to do and not to do. It's not just a collection of doctrines that we should agree with. 
It is walking in personal relationship with a Savior who transforms who we are as people. Not just our behaviors, but our mindsets, our attitudes, every part of our lives. It it takes us out of the kingdom of darkness and puts us into a kingdom of light. It puts us on a path that we follow the Lord into where he's leading us a certain place. That's the motivation of the Christian life as presented in the scripture. And the Bible gives us the why and the what and the how of life so that we might not only receive all that the Lord wants for us, but also so that we can be a blessing to the world around us rather than a curse, rather than a detriment. The Lord has us here so that we can bring the good news and to bring elements of his kingdom to the world around us. Verse 11, Abraham replied, I thought there's absolutely no fear of God in this place. They all kill me because of my wife. Besides, she really is my sister, the daughter of my father, though not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. So when God had me wander from my father's house, I said to her, show your loyalty to me wherever we go and say about me, he's my brother. Abraham makes his defense, but he doesn't hold up. Uh, He'd crumble under cross-examination here. If the place was really as bad as he was saying it is, why go there? There are other spots that he could take his herds. He makes this lame attempt to say, well, technically she's my sister. Okay, she was my father's daughter. Yeah, she was your father's daughter, but Abraham did not actually think of Sarah as his sister, not even a little bit, right? This is stupid. And, and, and he's lying to himself at this point. This is what we do when we try to rationalize our sin. We start spinning things in our minds. You see what he says there? He says, she became my wife. What could I do about it? It's like it almost happened on accident. I was was happy with her being my sister, but I guess she became my wife. This is all such a scam. Uh, Abraham should have just humbled himself and repented. He should have acknowledged that he was not honoring God in this situation and that as a result, he had wronged Abimelech and almost destroyed his own family life again. Indeed, he, he should have just just said, man, I'm just wrong, but he didn't. Instead, he tries to excuse himself. And maybe the saddest part of all of this, he seems to even back away from God. Hebrew scholars point out that when he says, God made me wander, he uses a plural noun and a plural verb. That means what he really said was, when the gods told me to go wandering. This is a really sad moment, I think. He speaks to Abimelech as if he's a polytheist. It's a complete breakdown of his faith. He's completely blown his testimony. He's completely made this bad decision. And now he kind of has a a Simon Peter, I don't know him moment. It's really sad. Verse 14, then Abimelech took flocks and herds and male and female slaves and gave them to Abraham. And he returned his wife, Sarah, to him. And Abimelech said, look, my land is before you. Settle wherever you want. And he said to Sarah, look, I'm giving your brother 1,000 pieces of silver. It's a verification of your honor to all who are with you. You are fully vindicated. 1,000 pieces of silver was the equivalent of 100 years wages, 100 years of an annual salary. It's a huge amount of money. And so Abimelech, we see, is showing humility and absolute readiness to do what God wanted no matter the cost, and it cost him pretty big. And I'm sure it was nice to have more possessions, but we remember that the whole point of Abraham's sojourn with God was that he was supposed to be a blessing to the nations of the world, not a liability to them. Abimelech is generous, even merciful on some level, but you can see that he's offended. He talks to Sarah about your brother, and he talks about your honor. And uh, we don't know his tone, but as if they had any honor left in this situation. This is not the kind of evangelism that we want to do. (laughs) If Abraham was our ambassador, we would recall him and say, you're done. (laughs) What does God do? Verse 17, then Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech, his wife, his female slaves, so they could bear children. For the Lord had completely closed all the wombs in Abimelech's household on account of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Isn't that just like God to take a story of sorry failure and end it with a display of life-saving grace? Abraham had let God down. He had let his wife down. He had let his new neighbors down. And it wasn't the first time he had ridden this ride before. He absolutely knew better. He had even moved perhaps into a level of denial of the one true God. And yet the Lord still loved him and was still going to use him. He was ready to restore him, and he did God wasn't embarrassed of Abraham. 
the man just needed correction. He just needed to get back on the wagon and trust the Lord and serve the Lord and represent the Lord again. And as the chapter closes, we're reminded that life comes from the Lord. He is the source of any worthwhile future you might have. His forgiveness stands ready to change hearts and lives. He was ready to forgive Abimelech, and he was ready to forgive Abraham and Sarah. And he's ready to forgive us of our own shortcomings, our own failures. But the lesions of sin need to be cut out. We can't just live with them and let them bleed all over us and all over our lives. We have to go to the Lord and allow Him to treat us, allow Him to do what He wants to do. He is the one that brings help and escape and repair to our hearts and to our families and to our societies. He's the hope. You know, the Waurani are also known to us as the Alkas, though I've learned that that is a pejorative term. Many of them were finally able to escape the cycle of death and bloodshed that they just couldn't get free of. You know how? Most of you know, many of you know who the Alcas are. The Alcas were set free from that cycle of death and bloodshed because some Christians came and said, we want to tell you about the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of them were named Jim and Elizabeth Elliot. Jim Elliot gave his life as a martyr for Jesus Christ. Elizabeth Elliot went back And instead of being a curse to them or instead of hating them or instead of fearing them, she said, I still want to tell you about the love of Jesus Christ. And they brought the gospel to these lost people. And because they walked by faith and trusted the Lord, they brought peace to a pagan place. The one society in in human history that has the highest murder rate ever. And they said, yeah, the gospel can come in and transform these people's lives. They shared righteousness and hope and joy and peace that continues to this day. That's our opportunity as well, maybe not as dramatic as going to Ecuador and getting speared uh, on a beach somewhere, but that's our opportunity to go and present the Lord to people and present righteousness and hope and joy that actually effuses through our lives and is actually real and lived out as we move through this world. And so, don't fall into old sins. Don't try to scheme your way through life. Remember what your pilgrimage is all about and allow the Lord to lead the way.